Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Many are still discussing the U.S. presidential debate between Trump and Biden on Thursday night. We have reaction and analysis. The Alberta government announced $35 million will be going towards a new addictions treatment center. And we hear from a 104-year-old B.C. resident who discusses the keys to living a long and healthy life. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. You know, a lot of people are still talking about the debate between U.S. President Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Many feel that Biden really didn't do himself any favors with his performance. You can include University of Michigan presidential debate expert Aaron Call in that conversation. Call says Biden's performance on Thursday night was probably the worst performance of a presidential candidate ever. Yeah, this was certainly not the opening debate performance that President uh, Biden wanted, especially the first 15, 20 minutes. Uh, historically, in these types of debates, incumbents struggle because they haven't debated in four years, they're busy running the country. But in this matchup, uh, the same, those same things applied uh, to Trump, where he started out fine. I think the, the first 15, 20 minutes would be considered probably the worst performance of a candidate, certainly an incumbent uh, candidate ever. I think that um, Trump did a good job of trying to some of the highlights of his administration. And really, January 6th was going to be a big vulnerability, but uh, trying to turn that into a positive in some ways, kind of uh, reverse the issue of saying about how things were different then in terms of uh, inflation and um, the stock market and things. It's kind of pre-Joe uh, President Biden. And so I thought that was an interesting novel approach. Um, and you know, some of the, the strength that, uh, that he projected and the lack of of international conflicts that existed when he was president. Um, now we've seen with Ukraine in the Middle East, just, you know, uh, maybe less chaos throughout the world, but maybe more internally. Um, so those were uh, those were strong, uh, both foreign policy and economy. For President Biden, um, I thought he expressed empathy on a lot of the questions and issues that they asked him about, uh, things like um, some of the, the economy, uh, joblessness, um, and also to the military, just making that personal connection to his son um, and what he's done for veterans. And Many would argue that former President Donald Trump easily won that presidential debate. Lisa Daftari is a regular contributor to Bridge City News and is also a political reporter south of the border. Lisa says the debate allowed Trump to shine a lot more than Biden. We should stop and give some credit to Donald Trump. I think he was much more professional, presidential, perhaps the fact that the mics were cut and he wasn't able to opine every time he wanted to was, was a blessing to him. Uh, he came off as really um, restraining himself in certain ways that have been criticized in the past. Uh, his points came across very clearly. Um, and that's not to say that it is in comparison to someone who is not, not coherent, but really by his own merits, I think Donald Trump did perform well. On the other hand, um, President Biden did not. And what's interesting here is that many people call this the wake up, right? Even uh, CNN talking about how he needs to be replaced and how um, this is really a wake up call to the Democrats to find a different candidate. They knew this all along. You know, um, anyone who was denying the fact where there was the media trying to cover it up, whether it was Jill Biden trying to just push her husband along to, to uh, uh, run again for a second term. Regardless, this was a disservice to this man. And I think a lot of people are refraining from calling anyone a winner or a loser felt very badly. Many people I saw on Twitter calling this elder abuse. You know, why was this even, why has it come to this point where this man should even be on stage falling flat on his face and not even being able to formulate complete sentences? Um, others are saying, no, he had a cold. Um, this is, you know, a great president, a great man and I'm going to vote for him over uh, Donald Trump, who they're calling, you know, a criminal or whatever they, they call him. Um, look, regardless, I think this was a very, um, very dangerous moment for the United States in terms of having our enemies watch. It was a dangerous moment in terms of saying, you know, the country is right now, forget about the election, right now in the hands of someone who is not competent to run a country. That was U.S. political reporter Lisa Daftari joining us from Los Angeles. A group representing child care providers is urging the Alberta government to opt out of the $10 a day national child care program. The Association of Child Care Entrepreneurs says it applauds Premier Smith's recent decision to opt out of the national dental care plan and wants similar action taken on child care. 
Association Chair Crystal Churcher says the National Child Care Program has been beneficial to parents from an affordability standpoint. She says, however, it is also limiting choice for parents, creating financial hardships for the province's private child care providers and leading to long wait lists for child care spaces. We're not against affordable child care. We absolutely believe 100% in affordable child care. But we want affordable child care that actually works for families and operators and that families can get a space in. Because right now they can't. It sounds wonderful on paper, but you can't actually get a spot. I think that the province should absolutely provide affordable child care. But I think that, you know, um, what we're seeing our premier do for other industries like oil and gas or even opting out of things like the National Pharmacare Program, the National Dental Program, because those national programs as well you know, as well intended as they are and how wonderful they sound when they're being marketed to Canadians, um, come with a ton of issues. The Association of Child Care Entrepreneurs is the same group that organized a series of province-wide closures of child care centres back in January to protest the $10 a day daycare initiative. The Alberta government is teaming up with the Siksika Nation and breaking ground on a new addictions treatment centre. Government officials say the Siksika Recovery Community is a $35 million investment that will add 76 long-term treatment beds in the region. It will support 300 people annually in their pursuit of recovery. We have started down this path where we've committed to 11 recovery communities, five with Indigenous partners. And I could not be more proud to be here today, this auspicious occasion, announcing this groundbreaking, this beautiful $35 million facility with 76 beds for recovery that is going to be land-based healing in Indigenous culture, owned and led by the Siksika Nation. I think it's so important when we look at this beautiful landscape we have behind us today to understand it's an integral part of the vision of the Siksika Nation on how they do recovery and treatment deeply integrated into their very proud and important First Nation culture. A former University of Lethbridge Chancellor and current CEO of the Blood Tribe Department of Health has been given our country's highest honour. Charles Weaselhead has been named to the Order of Canada. It's in recognition of his efforts to advance reconciliation in the country, along with his contributions to the Canadian Red Cross. In 2023, he was named to the Order of the Red Cross when he helped launch new social, health and education initiatives while he was Blood Tribe Chief and Treaty 7 Grand Chief. The Lethbridge Police, with the help of the Blackfoot artist Ina Fairbanks, unveiled a new logo representing the Lethbridge Police values at the city's downtown headquarters on Friday. Initiated by Trisley Blackwater, a summer student at LPS, the artwork displays a chief leader and a police officer participating in a pipe ceremony, which is a symbolic tradition that represents reconciliation. The piece depicts the five values of the Lethbridge Police in English and Blackfoot, respect, courage, accountability, collaboration, and professionalism. The logo is featured throughout the police station, including the main foyer. The food scene in Lethbridge remains strong and vibrant despite the closing of some high-profile restaurant franchises here in the city. The CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge, Trevor Lewington, says locals shouldn't read too much into Harvey's, Swiss Chalet, and Montana's closing down here in our city. Although these are national chains, he says the local restaurants are usually operated by franchisees who may just have a little bit of a harder time making a go of it. He points out the city is still home to many national chains, along with a thriving locally owned restaurant scene. I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Um, Lethbridge as a market tends to have more restaurants per capita than most other communities our size. We're well represented. And the exciting thing I think is we've got a lot of local Lethbridge only restaurants that are locally owned, locally operated with very unique menus that are quite popular. And so it might be just a function that these small local businesses are stronger and more, you know, more competitive perhaps than in some other markets. So restaurants come and go, brands come and go, you know, they certainly change their presence, change their branding. Uh, again, not a concern, I think, for the local economy. Now, speaking of food, the famous Western Canada Rib Fest tour stops by our city here in Lethbridge this weekend. Today through Canada Day, visitors can try out four acclaimed barbecue stands, each with their own take on award-winning ribs, chicken, sausage, and barbecue sauces. 
Admission to the weekend event is free and will feature live music performances and family-friendly activities. Saturday, we'll host an open cornhole tournament and on Canada Day, lots of movies to enjoy. The community will vote for the best ribs out of the vendors at the end of the long weekend. The Rib Fest regularly tours throughout cities in Western Canada over the summertime. Victoria, B.C. Police Staff Sergeant John Masuko says the wild bank robbery shootout two years ago outside of a Saanich, B.C. bank was just over 26 seconds. Two suspects were killed and six officers suffered from gunshot wounds. Masuko, who was shot in the foot, says he and his colleagues risked their lives to save 22 people inside of a Bank of Montreal that day. It's a really challenging position to be in, which is I've had a couple of minutes worth of time to drive to the bank, and now I've had 60 seconds worth of time to develop a plan and respond to two armed gunmen exiting a bank. And although it sounds like a lot, we are governed by these philosophies and these safety priorities that actually make these types of decisions relatively easy to make, even though in the grand scheme of things, these are big decisions. And so when I say these philosophies or these safety priorities, these are rankings that we have associated to like hostages, to innocent people and civilians, to police and to suspects. And it's not that we're ranking people's lives above one another, because all life is equal. All life is equal but it all relates back to control. So like a hostage and a hostage taking has the least amount of control because they're being held against their will and you, know, you have a suspect and et cetera, et cetera. So I put their safety at the top of the list, followed by innocent people and civilians. As you've heard on Bridge City News, no charges will be laid in connection with the collision between a bus and a semi-trailer that claimed the lives of 17 people in Western Manitoba last year. An investigation determined that blind spots on the bus played a major role. Early on, we were able to pull evidence from the semi-truck dash cam. This dash cam enabled us to gather that evidence and showed that the bus proceeded when it was unsafe. We reviewed multiple expert reports that were generated and all the opinions indicated that blind spots would be a significant issue in this case. Unfortunately, police are unable to speak to the bus driver nor do we anticipate being able to speak to him based on medical reasons. Therefore, we do not have the driver's account about what happened that day to help us understand his reasoning or actions of proceeding into the intersection. There are reports that the Israel Defense Forces have nearly dismantled the remaining Hamas brigades located in Rafah. As TBN Israel's Yair Pinto explains, the Israeli military is now preparing for a full-scale war with another terrorist group, Hezbollah, in Lebanon. While Israel is fighting to achieve its goals in Gaza, the winds of war are raging in the north. Former IDF chief of staff and current member of Knesset, Benny Gantz, spoke on Tuesday at the 21st Herzliya Conference at Reichman University. This annual event is a centerpiece of the conversation in Israel regarding strategic affairs and this year, the focus was on the growing possibility of war between Israel and Hezbollah. Gantz opened his remarks by saying, I say this in the most responsible way. Are we talking about a power cut in Israel? We have the ability to black out Lebanon, to break up its infrastructure and a large part of Hezbollah's military capabilities within days. But to get to this point, the price in Israel will be very heavy we must prepare for a scenario of damage to the infrastructure, even more incidents with many casualties. He continued, this is the price of war, which is desirable to prevent, but if we are forced into it, we must not shy away from it. A new encampment in support of the Palestinian people has been set up, but this time it's located in Montreal's Victoria Square. Protesters are demanding that the Quebec pension fund manager divest from any investments tied to Israel. The new encampment was also met by counter-protesters. So we are here, we're standing near the office of the Quebec Tesla Point Placement du Québec, from which we are asking the immediate divestment of the $14.2 billion it holds in investments in 87 companies complicit with Israeli occupation and ongoing genocide. 
Also, we are here near the office of the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs and Francophonie, uh, which is responsible to opening the Quebec office in Tel Aviv, in Israel, which we are asking the immediate shutdown. We don't think it's acceptable, as we're speaking now, to increase economic ties with a state that is currently going to genocide against the Palestinian people. This is a, a citizen initiative. This is uh, organized by the collective Divers for Palestine, which is a citizen collective that has been created to ask for the diversity of our... I wanted to see for myself what was going on. And uh, it's, it's certainly disheartening to have a, a beautiful public square on a beautiful day overtaken by people. And uh, the public can't enjoy what uh, the city built. Of course, the Canada will not divest, and of course, they will uh, in Quebec divest from Israel because Israel is an ally of Canada and a democratic uh, partner. So, what are the keys to living a long and healthy life? Maybe proper diet and exercise? How about playing some games? Lina Debray, who lives in a retirement home in Langley, British Columbia, is now 104 years old. She says what's helped her in her longevity was being a good eater and drinking lots of milk. I still enjoy life, and my hobbies is uh, playing cards and bingo. Try and lead a good life every day. Uh, some people take the wrong path. Um, pretty hard. Uh, I had uh, good parents, and we were eight in our family, and I think all of us turned good. I think I've always been a good eater. You know how some people, they just go on diets and they, yeah. Um, I still am you know, not too bad an eater. And I was too young, I just love milk. I drank a lot of milk. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I guess I should say, maybe that's why I might help. 104 years old. Wow. Congratulations, Lina. Well, school is out for the summer and parents are looking for fun activities for their children to participate in. Mitchell Meisler, family pastor of One Life Church here in Lethbridge, shares how Vacation Bible School, or VBS, is a great place for kids to let loose, make some new friends, and learn more about Christ. The one thing that we realized with VBS, it's, it's it's foundational, but it also is a place for kids to just be kids as well, especially in today's societies with all the pressures and everything else like that of, of goings ons. Um, there are so much more stress for these kids than there used to be. So it's a comfortable and wonderful place for kids to just have fun, be themselves, to not worry about anything else that's going on. Even just a three hour period is so important for them. Catch my full interview with Pastor Mitchell Meiselar and learn how you can register your kids for One Life Church's Vacation Bible School, or VBS, coming up later in our show. Well, it appears as though the moisture we've been receiving across much of southwestern Alberta will be leaving us shortly and just in time for the Canada Day long weekend. Full weather details are coming up. We experienced more rain today here in Lethbridge, but not a bad Canada Day long weekend is shaping up so far. Tonight, however, there's a slight chance of more shower activity developing with a low near 6 degrees. Tomorrow, partly cloudy with high expected near 20 degrees. Sunday, even warmer with a high near 24. Beautiful day. Canada Day holiday Monday, it should be mainly cloudy with the mercury dipping slightly to 17. Mainly sunny on Tuesday with a high near 21. Wednesday, overcast with a high of 19. And on Thursday, partly cloudy with a high of 23 degrees. Now, the average high for this time of year is 24 degrees with an average low of 10. The record high was 33 degrees set back in 1984. And the record low, the freezing mark, set back in 1946. The sun rose at 527 and set at 943. Let's see how Saturday is shaping up across our beautiful country now. Expect showers in 18 degrees in Victoria, mostly cloudy, and 20 degrees for Vancouver. It should be mainly sunny and 24 in Edmonton, partly cloudy and a high of 20 degrees for Calgary on Saturday. Expect lots of sunshine and blue sky with a high of 18 in Regina, a blue sky as well and 19 degrees for Saskatoon, mainly sunny and 18 in Winnipeg. Now in the central part of the country, expect rain and 25 degrees in Toronto, showers and 22 is on tap for Ottawa 
rain clouds, and 25 with lots of humidity for Montreal. In Atlantic Canada, there will be clouds mixed with sun and a high of 21 in both Fredericton and Halifax. Lots of sunshine and a high of 22 degrees for Charlottetown. And in St. John's, it will also be sunny with a high near 15 degrees on Saturday. A possible long weekend mechanic strike at WestJet has been averted. The federal labor minister has directed the airline and mechanics into binding arbitration to resolve their dispute, a move that it all but certain will postpone the work stoppage. A strike by mechanics with the Aircraft Mechanics Fraternal Association could otherwise have disrupted flights for hundreds of thousands of travelers over the Canada Day long weekend. Labor Minister Shaveman O'Regan says in a social media post late Thursday, he's invoking his authority under the Canada Labor Code to resolve the impasse between the two sides as the clock click kicked down toward a Friday evening deadline. The Canadian economy is expected to grow 1.8% in the second quarter. Stats Canada says that is slightly stronger than the 1.7% growth we saw in the first three months of the year. That's also more than what the central bank and economists were predicting. Early data says gross domestic product grew 0.1% in May, with most of the growth seen in real estate, manufacturing and finance. It offset declines in retail and wholesale trade. Experts say the latest results may motivate the Bank of Canada to cut its key lending rate even further. It's currently sitting at 4.75%. Having different generations of the workplace can be rewarding and yet sometimes very challenging. Sociologist Dr. Scott DeLong says the older generation must recognize and be sensitive to the fact that many of the younger generation are more in tune with their needs. He says there's much to be learned. The younger generations are much more in tuned to their needs, and they should be. Um, the older generations, we take a look at it and say, well, just get on with it, move on. Things happen, move on. And while that gets things done faster, it, the depth with the, the concern for, the, for, for what's inside the person really does matter. Make sure you catch the full interview with sociologist and author Dr. Scott DeLong and myself coming up in the second half of our program. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 66 points on the day to finish at 21,875. The Dow was down 45 points to 39,118. The S&P 500 was down 22 on the day to 54.60, and the Nasdaq was down 126 points to 17,732. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 24 cents to 81.50 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was down 8 cents to 260 U.S. Gold was down 98 cents on the day to 23.2676 U.S. an ounce, and silver was up 17 cents to 29.14 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $7.95 per bushel, barley's at $5.99, canola's at $14.17, and corn is at $7.24 per bushel. Live cattle were down $0.68 cents to $1.93.50. Feeder cattle August contract was down $1.35 to $2.59.30, and lean hogs July contract was up $0.13 cents to $89.58. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to $73.10 U.S. Recapping one of our top stories, a former University of Lethbridge Chancellor and current CEO of the Blood Tribe Department of Health has been granted our country's highest honour. Charles Weaselhead has been named to the Order of Canada. It's in recognition of his efforts to advance reconciliation here in our country, along with his contributions to the Canadian Red Cross. Congratulations. You know, this is the time of year when many kids head off to enjoy a wide range of summer activities. How about a summer event with a twist that offers a way to bring kids closer to Christ? Coming up, a one-on-one -on -one chat with Pastor Mitchell Mizelar, who will discuss the importance of Vacation Bible School, also known as VBS. Listen, when you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. You know, many of us attended summer vacation Bible school when we were children. Brings back a lot of great memories, a lot of fun. But you know, perhaps it was so much more than that. Joining us today to chit-chat a bit about it is Pastor Mitchell Mizelar. He's the family pastor of One Life Church here in Lethbridge. Welcome to Bridge City News, Pastor Mitchell. 
Thanks so much for having me, Hal. I really appreciate this. <laughs> Absolutely. I see that a number of Lethbridge churches will be hosting Vacation Bible School, also known as VBS this summer, including yours. Why is this so important for the spiritual and fundamental growth of our kids? Oh, absolutely. When you think about it, it's more than just uh, more than just something to do during the summertime. I believe it sets foundations for our kids that are needed, especially nowadays with how society is going. If we can get a firm foundation for our kids started at a young age, it's something that they're going to take with them the rest of their life. And maybe instead of focusing so much on sports, focus more on God, you know, have God fill that need in their lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, but I mean, at the same time, it's good to, it's fun to play sports. You're not sitting in front of a, a computer all the time playing video games, but it's just, we have to have good balance in our lives. So Pastor Mitchell, can non-Christian families participate as well in VBS? Most definitely. We actually encourage um, community members to actually come out to the event as well. It's more than just a Christian event. It is a community event. We want to build lasting relationships, not only with us as a church community, but also with our community at large in Lethbridge, Alberta. So when and where will this be taking place and what ages is this really for? So it will be taking place uh, actually over two weeks this year. We are doing it from July 15th to July 18th and July 22nd to 25th from 1.30 in the afternoon to 4.30 in the afternoon. And it will be hosted right here at One Life Church um, in Lethbridge, uh, 501 40th Street South. So how can parents get their kids registered? So they can go onto our website. Uh, we have a QR code that they can scan. Um, it's posted over our social media. Um, they can call us at the office, 403-394-7707, uh, and they can talk to myself, and we can get them registered. But there's lots of different ways that they can get registered. Now, your theme this year is meals and messages. What is that really all about? So we want to talk about meals throughout the Bible. So we start off actually with the first actual thing ever eaten in the Bible, which is, of course, the apple from the tree of good and evil, uh, which caused sin to enter the world. And we go all the way to the great banquet that Jesus talks about in uh, the New Testament about what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. So through all of it, we share stories and ideas of why meals are so significant in the Bible and the meanings behind a lot of them in the Bible as well. So what kinds of activities do you have planned for the kids? We have worship planned. We have games planned. We have puppets. We have um, activity pages. We have coloring pages. We have snacks. We have a whole lot going on in a three-hour period. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Puppets were huge, very popular when I was a kid, you know, 50 years ago, 45, 50 years ago. And they're still relevant today. You can still use them as an effective tool to deliver a message? Absolutely. I had always worried that it would be a, a, like a, a, a small thing that kids wouldn't find relevant anymore because ah, with video technology and everything else like that, and they love the puppets. We have one that actually it looks like me, and I bring him out every single year now, and even for our kids' ministry on Sunday, they love having him show up for kids' ministry and throughout the services as well. Not only for our kids, but our adults love the puppets as well. So, Well, everyone needs a mini-me, right? That's pretty important. It, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pastor, uh, perhaps VBS is a great opportunity maybe for kids to invite their friends and neighbors to come out and join them. You know, maybe people that otherwise would never attend a church. Absolutely. We, we talk to our kids about that, too, that it's not just, it's not just for us. It's for, for their friends, for their neighbors, all those kinds of things. We tell our teachers the same thing, too. If you've got neighborhood kids that need something to do during the summer, what better way to introduce them to God than to actually have them come to a VBS program? Now, too many children have lasting negative memories of their childhood growing up. So how can VBS, Vacation Bible School, leave positive lasting impressions for years to come to help really shape the mindset of our youth? Absolutely. The one thing that we realize with VBS, it, it's, it's foundational, but it also is a place for kids to just be kids as well, especially in today's societies with all the pressures and everything else like that of, of goings-ons. Um, there's so much more stress for these kids than there used to be. So it's a comfortable and wonderful place for kids to just 
have fun, be themselves, to not worry about anything else that's going on. Even just a three-hour period is so important for them. You know, it's interesting when my kids were little, you know, and we took them to youth group at one of the churches, and it just seemed like some of the kids didn't really want to accept our children because they were outsiders. They had their own little cliques, and, uh, you know, basically we, we pulled our children out of that youth group because they just weren't really accepted. How can you ensure that doesn't happen with a lot of the kids who take in VBS, that they are accepted and welcomed? So we have it actually broken up instead of, instead of like groups, like they would be for um, like small groups or those kinds of things. We actually broke it up into age categories. So ages fives and sixes are all together. Ages seven and eights are all together and nines and tens are all together. So it gets rid of that clicky feeling. So you don't have to worry about my best friend is here or my other friends are over here. It's more accepting that way than it would be if we just said, okay, find a group of people to connect together. It's no, we have your group set up together for you. So anybody is welcome into them. Almost like a prearranged marriage, except prearranged groups here with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Not as serious, though, as a prearranged marriage. <laughs> so, Pastor Mitchell, do you, do you have any personal memories of VBS from when you were a kid? I don't have personal memories from VBS. I grew up as a farm kid, so a lot of my time was spent on the farm during my summer holidays. But for me, a lot of the foundational stuff that I got was in my Sunday school. So I take a lot of that into my VBS programs right now, the foundations that were built up there, the basic Bible stories that we grew up learning and made us who we are today. So I may not have attended VBS, but I use a lot of those same concepts that I learned in Sunday school years ago and actually use them for VBS now. It's interesting. That's how I came to know Christ was through the Sunday school bus ministry. I was growing up in Calgary, First Church of the Nazarene downtown, sent out these Sunday school buses to different parts of Calgary. I was in the far southeast, about an hour away from downtown. They knocked on the door, and my father answered the door. He wasn't a believer at the time. I was seven years old. Hey, do you have a son or daughter who'd like to come join us in Sunday school? I asked Dad, can I go? And he's like, sure, why not? And that's how I came to know Christ, through the Sunday school bus ministry. So it had an amazing uh, impact on my life as well. Now, Pastor Mitchell, for a short period of time, you have the opportunity to share biblical principles with children, which can really help form godly character and values. Let's talk about the importance of that. It really is important, especially with how things are going in today's day and age. If we have that biblical foundation set up in their lives, it is so important because I believe that these things that we do nowadays are things that last for years to come. I, I listen to the stories and the experiences of, of older people in our congregation. They said VBS was how it all started for them. It may, may not be what caused them to become a Christian, but it did set up a foundation that kept them going later on as well. Uh, we have people who have been involved in VBS pretty much their entire life or, or bus ministries or all those kinds of things that are part of our VBS. So not only are we creating a foundation, we're also creating future leaders that will actually lead our VBS down the line when the day comes and I won't be able to do it anymore and keep up with the kids. Um, there will be a legacy of those kids that will actually be excited about teaching VBS and being a part of VBS down the road and teaching the next generation of kids of what VBS actually is. So how rewarding is it for the teachers and counselors who participate in VBS, helping to form a lot of the values in the children today? It is so valuable. Uh, all of our teachers always come away with stories about just being touched by those kids and just having those amazing opportunities just to speak into these kids' lives. Um, we always find it so hard to stop VBS. We just want to keep going with VBS. If we, could, if we could, we would do it all summer long and just build those relationships with those kids because it's not only touching kids' lives, it is touching our teachers' lives and our volunteers' lives as well. So it is just, it's just as important for the kids as it is for our ministry team as well. So everybody's growing as you learn together. That's wonderful. Do you find that children sometimes ask a lot of questions about spiritual things at VBS? We do actually have a lot of spiritual questions that get asked, especially when it comes to when we do our Bible verses or Bible stories. They will ask, why does it 
say this in the Bible? Or what's the purpose of this behind the Bible? Or why is Jesus doing it this way? We get a lot of those types of questions. But the other thing is also, once we get towards the end of the week, those kids open up and it's more just about, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me with this? Can you pray for me for this? Um, it's not just biblical principles. It's also them just opening up to us as in general about who they are as well. So what kind of feedback do you get from the parents after the VBS is finished and the kids come back home? Oh, we always get good feedback in regards to parents. A, because it's a nice break for parents initially. That's normally how it starts off is, okay, I have somewhere for my kid to go for the afternoon so I can go and get X, Y, Z done at home. But then when the kid comes home and they start to tell them all of the stories and the things that they've learned, they come back and they say, you know what, we really appreciate just what it is that you're teaching our kid or, you know what, just spending some time with our kid because it's so important that they're not getting it somewhere else. It's a good place and a healthy environment for them to be in. So when that seed is planted early on with a lot of our youth, do you find sometimes through VBS that our children reach out to their friends or maybe their brothers and sisters, inviting them to VBS the following year? Absolutely. And we're, uh, we're in the process of, of looking at all of our numbers for this year, and we're expecting to have more kids for a VBS program than we did previous years. So that just goes to show you that they're inviting their friends and neighbors and those kinds of things. And not only that, our, our kids ministry, and our youth ministry have grown because of the relationships that have been built up in our VBS program as well. Have you heard of kids inviting their parents to maybe take them to church after attending VBS? So this can be beneficial for the parents as well? Absolutely. We have we have heard time and time again, if you get the kid, chances are you can probably get the parent as well because the kid enjoys it so much that they want mom and dad to come and see what it is that they're, that they're doing. Or not only that, the kids want to come back to Sunday school or VBS, so they will drag mom and dad just so that they can be there for it. So it's a way to minister to mom and dad without having to go out door knocking and saying, hey, come to church. It's the kids who bring them there, not us who have to go out and get them. That's pretty cool that the children have that kind of influence on their parents as well, not just the parents on the kids. What about taking their spiritual walk to the next level with a lot of these young people following VBS? What are you seeing? So with a lot of this, how we see this is, like I said, it, it's it's the foundational thing. But I mean, we'll invite them to other activities we'll have going on during the summer, or they can come and once fall programs start up, we have um, a young youth program, we have our kids ministry programs going on, we have our older youth ministry programs going on. We try and have an all-encompassing ministry for all ages, and we try and get them plugged in that way. If they can't make it, we try and plug them into other different church communities that are might be closer to them that they would feel comfortable going to. So we don't have to worry about transportation or anything else like that. It's not just our philosophy is that it's not just a one life church thing. This is the Church of Lethbridge thing. It is the ecclesia that we are building up all together. It is not just about us. It's about Lethbridge just in general. So wherever we can plug them in, that's awesome. You know, it's funny, when I was a youth as well, I loved getting together with a lot of my friends through church and going bowling. That seemed to be a real special bonding moment. Is bowling still prevalent today? Is it still pretty popular? I can't I can't say that we have taken our team bowling, but I have heard of, of teams going bowling. Uh, the big thing is now is we have the Coliseum in Lethbridge where it's, where it's um, archery or laser tag or those kind of things. All things that I am not well equipped to do anymore. I can barely run around with our kids for the three hours that we have them for. But there is still that activity present in regards to our to our youth and, and young people as well. You know, I took my kids uh, for some of their birthday parties to laser tag parties. And I'll let you in on a little secret. Pick the smallest people to be part of your team. Not guys my size, six foot four. We're too big of targets. We'll lose every time. So, Pastor Mitchell, remind our viewers one more time how they can get their kids registered for Vacation Bible School and when and where it will be taking place. Absolutely. So if you go to our website, uh, onelifechurch.ca, uh, you will see it posted on there. You can click or scan the QR code that'll be there that'll take you to a registration form. You can fill that out. Uh, you can call us at the office, 403-394-7707, and ask for myself, and I would be happy to get you registered for it. Or, in all honesty, 
just show up when we have it. So that'll be starting July 15th through the 18th and then July 22nd through the 28th uh, from 1.30 in the afternoon till 4.30 in the afternoon. Pastor Mitchell Mizelar is the family pastor at One Life Church here in Lethbridge. Thanks so much for joining us today to talk about Vacation Bible School. Al, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Today's workforce appears to be going through some demographic changes with multiple generations working together. Sometimes this has the potential to make for some tension and stress in the workplace, which can impact our overall mental health. Joining us now from Orange County, California to chat about it is Dr. Scott DeLong. Uh, he's a sociologist and workplace expert. He's also author of the book, I Thought I Was a Leader, A Journey to Building Trust, Leading Teams and Inspiring Change. Scott, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you very much, Hal. I really appreciate your opportunity to, to be here. You bet. Now, in your book, you say the landscape is changing with Gen Z's about to outnumber baby boomers. So where and why are we seeing tensions and stress happening between the different generations here in the workplace? Well, because there's a gap of four generations now, right? The big baby boomers, and then you have the, the Gen X, and then millennials, and then the Gen Z. And typically, you only have a gap of one, you know, three of them instead of four. But now we have four. And, and the the larger the gap, the bigger the differences are going to be just based on our experiences, the things that we have seen versus what they have seen. And you're going to see that. There's communication differences. There are uh, different, certainly mental health concern differences. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, those of us in my generation, and I'm 64 years old, so those of us in my generation, we were taught to buck up, dude, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you know, if you go see a counselor or a psychologist, that's an area of weakness. And and yet we taught our children differently. We taught them to be concerned about their feelings and to recognize their feelings. So while they have a completely different point of view on what mental health looks like, it's us, the older generations, that taught them how to do that. And yet we don't we don't embrace that ourselves. So it's so you're gonna see gaps. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting, you even see that in professional sports nowadays. And when I was a kid, you know, and I played football, it was like, okay, you just dislocated your finger, you know, put it back into place and get out for the next play. Or, or you know, yeah, the wind knocked out of you, or maybe there's a cracked rib, you know, tape it up and go back out again. But nowadays, it's a lot different. So it's, I think you're right, society has changed quite a bit. Now, Scott, when you see a lot of conflict in the workplace, not on yeah. the field, to what degree can this affect the mental health of employees? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Conflict, so I, I reframe conflict to just a difference of opinion. It can turn into a war, a fight, a battle, and those things certainly can, can affect the mental health of people. If they, if they get into a place where they feel like they're not, their, their experience is not valued, that they don't have a, a safe place to go, it is going to affect the mental health of people. If we reframe conflict to looking at just a difference of opinion, and that we want to explore those opinions because there's a lot of reasons to explore difference of opinion. One, one, it's going to make me smarter. I'm going to get, I'm going to have more information if I'm willing to listen and, and open up. But two, it's going to make a connection better between human beings, right? This, this, we talk about respecting others, and and respect to me is not just the type of respect that my dad taught me. Respect is earned; it's not given. But respect is more respect for human dignity, and that now more than any other time is so vital, especially when you see these big gaps in the generations, the respect for them, whoever them is, the other group, whether it's the young people looking up to the old people or the old people looking up to the young people, having respect for what it is that who they are, what they know, how they can help and how they can benefit is a big difference. And if we look at it like that, we have less conflict and we just have a difference of opinion and a way for each to teach each other something new, something new about the world that they didn't recognize before. You know, it's true. When we learn, we grow. I mean, even though I'm a Gen Xer, I work with some millennials and uh, I work with some Gen Z employees yeah. here too. And I learn from them as well. At the same time, they help teach me something new as I help teach them and maybe nurture and mentor them as well. So it's nice how we learn and grow, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And, and I think I'm going to take that back to a, a chapter uh, in my book on humility, right? And 
I frame humility a little bit differently than most people do as well. Humility to me is not thinking less of myself or, 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 or pushing off the praise that people might give me. It's not that at all. Humility for me is the is to recognize the human dignity in everybody and that I can learn from anybody. And whether they're Gen Zs, there's a lot that these folks can teach me. And it's not just on technology, but the whole mental health piece. Like, like this whole pull yourself up by the bootstrap, great idea, but darn, things happen in life, right? And I could use some support too. If I'd just be willing to open up about it. So Scott, how are the generations different in their attitudes towards workplace mental health? Compare someone like me who's a Gen Xer versus someone like my son who's a millennial. Yeah, I think, um, and, and it gets even, even deeper when we talk about the folks in the Gen Z. They are, the younger generations are much more in tuned to their needs, and they should be. Um, the older generations, we take a look at it and say, well, just get on with it, move on. Things happen, move on. And while that gets things done faster, it, the depth with the, the concern for, the, for, for what's inside the person really does matter. So why doesn't a one-size-fits-all generations approach really work for supporting workplace mental health? Well, one-size-fits-all doesn't work because we have different needs or recognition of the different needs that we have with each other. I don't, I'm going to look at it like uh, I don't need the help. I'm going to, I'm just going to get through this. Whereas the younger people actually want some support and want some place to go and talk. But when you get back down to it, we're all human beings and we all have a lot of the same needs. We have the, the need to feel connection. We have the need to feel that we are valued and that other people consider us worthy. So there is a little bit of a one size fits all approach, but how to get there, right? The one size fits all approach is to make people feel whole. How we go about that is different by the generations. So Scott, what should companies do to accommodate these generational needs for supporting mental health in the workplace? It's all about communication with me. So the first thing that I think we need to do is we need to teach our supervisors, our managers, our directors, and our vice presidents that these issues are important and they're real and that they affect the company's bottom line too. It's not just the humanity piece, but it affects the bottom line as well. So if we teach people that these, these things are real and that we need to take the time to have commun open communication with folks and that it's okay to be a little bit vulnerable, that those communication can take place. Can communication again is the key. It is the solution to most of the mental, not, not serious mental health issues. I'm not talking about psychosis and all that, but I'm talking about the, the, the feeling that we belong piece and having the different generations open up and talk to each other, be a little vulnerable, be a little humble, show some empathy with each other. We're gonna make connections a lot deeper. So how can a company really gauge if they're really hitting the mark on this when it comes to communication? Is there a proper way to potentially evaluate? Yeah, there, there really is. And, it, and it's, it's a matter of opening your eyes and, and paying attention. So the first thing that you're going to see when, when we're not addressing the concerns of people is the high turnover rate. We saw that during COVID and it has, has gotten a little bit better, but not a lot better. People are out there looking for new opportunities. What I'm suggesting is that with this open communication policy and processes and, and feeling for huma humanity, right, for people, that we're going to have much less turnover. So your turnover rate is the key. The other key is that you take a look, look for in the business environment is are people missing deadlines? Are, is, the, is the clarity not there on what expected of them? Um, if they're not engaging in meetings, if they're not willing to open up and talk, you're gonna start seeing those as subtle clues. But the reality is it's gonna hit home when people are taking more time off work or if they're switching jobs. You know, one of my coworkers said, it's uh, also called quiet quitting sometimes. You know, when somebody almost goes into a shell and stops the communicating, just does the basics, doesn't go the extra mile anymore, and you start to see that in your, your fellow coworkers. Now, I'm guessing that sometimes generations communicate a little differently. Now, some like to communicate via text, 
They say, why did you call me? You know, just text me. Don't call me. And I'm like, what? I'm from the old school. I'd like to either call somebody or talk to them face to face, while even other people prefer online platforms to communicate. So how do we kind of maneuver and work through all of this? So this is the one area that I think the older generations do a, a little bit better job with. So we have something that we've, we've created called the communication hierarchy. And what it suggests is that the Bigger, the greater the chance for conflict, meaning just a difference of opinion, the higher up the communication hierarchy we need to go. At the top of it is face-to-face -face communication. Below that is what we're doing right now, a video call. So we can, I can see your, your reactions and I can, I can gauge with your tone of voice. Below that's a phone call. Below that is email and below that is text, right? The only thing lower than the text communication, when there's conflict, potential for conflict, conflict meaning you're going to see things differently than I do. That's all, right? The, the, the more chance for that, the higher up this ladder we need to go in order to effectively communicate. How often have you seen a text message go wrong or an email that someone responds to improperly? So these are some of the things that this, the solar folks are going to need to help the younger people understand the value of this face-to-face -face communication. Whereas... A text is great if, if uh, someone wants to text it. Hey, meet you at the movies at 5.30. Great. No conflict there. It's much more efficient to communicate via text and email, but it's not as effective. And I prefer effectiveness over efficiency any day. A lot less misunderstandings as well. Like you said, if you meet somebody face-to-face -face or do a Zoom call or whatever, and yeah, a lot less miscommunication there. Right. Uh, absolutely. I like and, and I tell people all the time, you start getting these emails going back and forth and they start escalating. Right. The, the tension starts escalating. And as soon as you see this difference of opinion, pick up the phone, walk down the hall. Like, let's get let's get some emotion. Let's get some voice into this conversation as opposed to the written language. The written language is almost always read, read one level below my intention, like one level more hostile than my intention. And it's just, it just works out that way. So if I'm going to suggest somebody have do something differently, I'm not going to do it via email. I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to walk down to their office. I'm going to give them a call and, 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 and talk about it so that they can see my intention. And then the impact is equal to the intention. Intention and impact are so often different, especially when we're texting or sending emails. You know, it's funny, a couple of times my mother, when she was still alive, may she rest in peace, she would text me and a couple of times she had her caps lock on and everything was uppercase and yeah. that usually says you're yelling at somebody, you're angry, right? Yeah. And I let her know, yeah. I said, what's, what's, are you okay, mom? Are you angry? No, I'm not angry. Why do you keep asking me that, right? <laughs> <laughs> See, again, generational divides, right? <laughs> so, so you know that that uppercase means yelling and she just thinks it <laughs> means emphasis, that's all. So what can we, as the more mature, older generation, learn from our younger colleagues, especially when it comes to communication? Well, th there's so much to learn from them. So if, if it's true, and it is, that between Gen Z and millennials, more than 50% of our current workforce, that also extrapolates to say that they're probably more than 50% of our current customer base. Our future is in these folks. Do you want me? a baby boomer making decisions on our future when these folks know what's happening, know what they're going to be needing, right? So what can we learn from them? We can learn what's happening now and in our future. What can they learn from us? Some old tried and true ways. We have experience, we have some wisdom, and sharing that with each other is, is the key to making this process work. And the sharing it is is that communication piece, right? That helps bridge that mental health gap that we're talking about as well. If I just look at them and say, oh, they're just young people and they don't matter and whatever, how are they gonna receive that? Or, or the other way around, he's just an old guy, what does he know, right? As opposed to sharing our information together so that we can both learn and grow, but more than that, we can connect on a human level. And never start a sentence with, back in my day, <laughs> That'll put up the walls and close off the communication right away, right? Yeah. So one of the things that I that I like to to talk about is is how to get across um, ideas, new ideas, or or ideas that I'd like to have done. And that is, I consider them. So we discuss what the problem is. All right. Here's a, here's a problem. What I come up with, or they come up with, is a potential solution, 
And then I'll always end with this. What do you think? That is a dialogue starter, right? It's not, we need to do this and we need to do it now. Never do that, right? So what I'll do is come up with a potential solution, say, what I think we ought to do is such and such. What do you think? Get that dialogue going. And you will see that the people will respond to that. They, they are going to be wel uh, they welcome the opportunity that I care about what they have to think. And there's age differences and power differences and all of that. But when I reach out to you and say, hey, hey, Hal, what do you think? What does that do? It draws you closer. It shows you really value them as a person, right? Absolutely. So what suggestions, Scott, do you have for people looking for ways to get support for their mental health at work? It requires a few, and back to those, those, those three principles that I was talking about, humility, vulnerability, and empathy, um, being willing to. In order for that to happen, though, that there, there has to be psychological safety created within the organization. And psychological safety just means this, that people do not fear of any repercussion for anything that they might say, right? And, and so it's a top-down driven initiative that, that leadership has to impose. We are going to create a safe environment for people to be able to communicate. Now, here's the problem with that, though. Anybody in the room can ruin psychological safety. Even if the leader is, is promoting it and saying, here's what we do and here's how we operate and this is our culture, one person over in the corner rolling their eyes at me as I'm exposing myself will get me to shut down immediately. So it's got to be driven through the entire organization that it's okay. It's okay. This is safe. You can talk to me about this. Dr. Scott DeLong is author of the book, I Thought I Was a Leader, and it's available at scottdelong.net. Scott, thanks so much for joining us today from Orange County, California. Thank you, Hal. I really appreciate being here. Thanks for the opportunity. You bet. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks for watching.